This week on the Computer Chronicles, a sneak preview of Copeland, the new operating system for the Macintosh. A look at three new Mac clones from Radius, Power Computing, and Daystar Digital. Want a portable Power Mac? We'll show you the new Power PC PowerBook. On Net News, we'll check out the Power Computing website and show you how to get a sneak preview of the Copeland interface. Plus, this week's computer news. All this and more coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard Personal Computers, developing PCs for business. The Computer Chronicles is also made possible by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. If you're a Mac head, you might like this little button, if you can see it here. It says Windows 95 equals Macintosh 89. Yes, the Mac operating system has been doing long file names, plug and play, drag and drop, all that stuff for many years. But Apple is not standing still. With the competition now coming from Windows 95, Apple's about to launch its own new operating system, codenamed Copeland. This is the first major upgrade to the Mac OS in many years, and here to give us a sneak preview of the Mac OS that will be coming out in 96 is Adam Samuels of Apple Computer. Welcome, Thanks. Adam. Thanks. Uh, real quickly, in a nutshell, what's going to be new about Copeland? The big improvements in Copeland are really focused on two things. One is improving people's productivity. We want people to be more efficient. We want them to get more accomplished in less time. And the second is giving them a way to take advantage of the performance of the PowerPC chip. So Copeland is going to do a lot to help in that area. All right, you've got a lot of stuff to show us. So I want to just let you roll and show us as many of the new features of Copeland as you can now. Okay, thanks. First of all, one of the things we recognize is there's a lot that people would like to do with a Macintosh today. They want to be able to make multiple copies. They want to be able to empty the trash. They even want to be able to open an application and have that all happen simultaneously. So you were doing three things at once there. Right. And I also want to be able to switch between them and keep track of the progress. So we now have a whole new level of multitasking available in Copeland. And we think that is going to help people's efficiency dramatically. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Okay. One other thing we know is people have more and more information on their computers. They get more and more information from online services and from the network. You can't find stuff? It's really tough to find things. So we have a new, really advanced find capability that's really exciting. One of the things about it that's great is you can look not just for the title of a document and what's contained there, but for what's inside the document itself. Mm -hmm. So in this case here, I'll search for the word seafood pasta. And I get a list very quickly of items here. This is a multitasking process. It's easy to use. And I can directly manipulate these items. I can treat this window like any other window. I can retype a name here in the list, and it changes the name of the item on the desktop. Hmm. The other thing we recognize is people do a lot of searching constantly on the same items. So we can save a find now. And the find actually is smart. It automatically updates when you uh, add new information. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, here I were to insert a floppy disk, the floppy disk has some content, which will show up in a second, and you'll see the list updates to include the new items that match the criteria. So much more intelligent finder. Exactly. Okay, what else do we have that's new? The third area is really one that I'm really excited about, and that has to do with the fact that our users have many different levels of experience, and some of them even share the same computer. Right. So Copeland will give people the way to set up private kind of areas to work on the system that basically give information that's appropriate to each user's level and needs. So here I have a system that's button-based very easy to use with a limited number of menu selections. This is a user who may be just getting started or doesn't need to know a lot okay, about Okay, so this yet. is one particular user's profile. Exactly. And the interface is tailored to that person's level of knowledge. That's correct. I have a couple of other examples here. Here's one of more of an intermediate user who, as you see, has the traditional files and folders. And they have a couple of more menu selections here based on their own needs and, and, mm -hmm. and requirements. For an advanced user, we even give the capability to put in a password to protect access. And then we have the full richness of the Macintosh experience available here. So you see we've got the great selection of menu items that are available. And this is one way that people can customize their computer. A second way, though, is they can actually alter the appearance of the machine to better fit their own style mm -hmm. and personality. So in this case, this user has an alternate theme that they're going to select, and the computer will basically update to show this whole new theme. And what's great is this is not just something you see at the desktop. If you so open the applications app will follow the theme. Yes, and I'll show you. Clarisworks here does just that. Uh -huh. And you'll see that the menu bar looks more, you know, it looks more in keeping yeah, with this yeah. new style, but everything else is consistent. And what's really exciting is you can combine these. 
So for example, if you're a child, you could set up a, an environment that had a very simple user interface, but a very fun and attractive theme. So let me show that here. We've got button-based, mm. very appealing. We've even added new sounds Perfect for kids, yeah. and animation. And we think this will keep people excited and looking at the computer on an ongoing basis. The new Mac OS due out in 1996 sometime. Yes, that's right. Adam, thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. Because of the competitive pressures, Apple is doing more than just upgrading its Macintosh operating system. It has begun to license the Mac OS and authorize the manufacture and sale of Macintosh clones. One of the first Mac clones comes from Radius, and we found several of these new Mac compatibles being used at the CKS Partners ad agency in San Francisco. The CKS Group has been called a new generation integrated advertising agency, a sort of all-purpose shop that uses multiple media to promote its clients. The high-tech agency, based in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, produces ads for every kind of venue, from paper to cyberspace. And since paper is still an important medium, CKS has been looking for ways to simplify the process of bringing an idea to print. One way to do that is to bring color proofing in-house. It's part of the process called digital prepress. Well, digital prepress uh, is really the production extension of the uh, creative work that we do uh, toward print. And uh, what we're doing is uh, looking at uh, ways of shortening the cycle of, uh, from creative to getting ink on paper. And one of the keys to that really is um, the proofing and uh, image, the image processing and proofing uh, phase of the job, which uh, often is uh, time consuming. CKS adopted the Radius System 100, a desktop imaging system based on the Apple approved Radius clone of the Power Macintosh. System 100 runs on a 110 megahertz PowerPC chip and includes high speed graphics processing, Adobe Photoshop, and a color reference display monitor. The monitor's integrated color calibration is the key to making accurate soft proofing possible. The artist uses one Macintosh for retouching scanned images and photos, then transfers the graphics to the radius for compositing and digital soft proofing. To me, soft proofing is uh, really something that's really grown out of um, having color of a color management system that is predictable. And uh, when when you can rely on your screen image to be as close as possible to a standard proofing system, then suddenly um, what you see on your screen uh, has greater uh, value and greater importance. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. In addition to the Radius System 100, Apple has also licensed the Mac OS to two other companies, Power Computing and Daystar Digital. Here to show us the new Power 100 is Bob Levitis. Welcome, Bob. Thanks. All right, we've got your Power 100 here. It's not turned on, nothing on the screen, because, like, what's to see? It's right. a Mac, right? It's Just like look, a Mac. It's going to look like a Macintosh. Absolutely. The box doesn't obviously look like a Macintosh, so let me ask you to pop the lid, and let's talk about what's inside here and how it's different and how it's the same as an Apple Mac. And let me angle this up here so our cameras can get a good shot of it and give us a little kind of guided tour of what's inside. Okay, the let's start over here. This is an Apple ROM. This is a cache sim. That's the CPU, a PowerPC mm -hmm. 601 running at 100 megahertz. All the little gray guys on there are the Apple Custom Asics. There's 16 of them. These are RAM sims. We have eight RAM sim slots over here making mm -hmm. expansion very easy. This is our I.O. card. This, now, uh, this is different from what we'd see in a Mac, obviously. Yes. Uh, on a Power Mac 8100, all the circuitry is on the motherboard. And so the difference is we've moved it to the daughter card, makes it easier for us to make changes to it over time. And it also lets you squeeze this inside this AT box, which is part of the design. Yeah, absolutely. I forgot about that. Okay. Good point. And over here we have uh, three new bus slots. And finally, this is the high-performance video card. The high-performance video is another piece that's also on the Apple motherboard. We've moved it to the daughter card. We've added one little feature. This card uh, offers a Macintosh and a VGA video mm -hmm. port. Great. All right, now you have another nice design feature here, and show us that one. Yes, this our engineers really like this one. This is, uh, makes it very easy to add a second internal disk drive. You just unscrew one screw, open the hinge like this, put uh -huh. the drive in, snap it back into place. We've designed the system to be very easy to work inside, uh, very open. 
So you've really taken the economics of a, of a PCAT design, really, and put Macintosh stuff inside. That's exactly what we're doing. We're driving the price of Mac OS systems down by using proven PC technology yeah. uh, and cases and power supplies. The issue for a user is, as it was with PC compatibles way back when, is it really 100% compatible with an Apple Macintosh, and can I run all my software on this? Absolutely. Everything that runs on a Power Mac 8100 is guaranteed to run on this system. Apple certifies our systems before we're able to ship them. Apple says this is really compatible, mm -hmm. so you can you can be very comfortable that it is. All right, when I buy the Power 100, what do I get? Well, you get the system itself. Uh, base system is $1,699, and that's an 8540 mm -hmm. configuration. Um, we also offer, you know, CD-ROM upgrade. Right. Uh, yeah, the software bundle comes with it. Yes, yeah, software bundle, $900 worth of software, including Claris Works, now up to date, mm -hmm. now contact. FWB hard disk toolkit, which improves the performance of our hard disks. FWB's CD-ROM toolkit, which gives us a little bit better CD-ROM performance, uh, 250 fonts, soft Windows uh, demo that's uh -huh. a 90 day trial kit, uh, and the keyboard. I don't have to pay extra for the keyboard. No, you don't have to pay extra for the Isn't keyboard. Isn't competition wonderful? Daystar Digital has pushed the Macintosh design to its limit with a new multiprocessor version called the Genesis MP. Joining us for a demo of this new Monster Mac is Jack Kolk of Daystar. Welcome, Jack. Thank you. Okay, you've pulled the, the door up there so we can see inside this machine, and it's, it's very powerful, lots of expandability, lots of processors, lots of memory. Give us a tour of what's inside there, Jack. Uh, inside the Daystar Genesis MP, we have the four processor, 132 megahertz card, which is, in fact, upgradable and, and can be moved. We have six internal PCI slots. This is the video card here we see. We have 12 DIMM slots, allowing this machine to be expanded to 1.5 gigabytes of memory. We have seven internal drive bays allowing you to put uh, internal drive expansion uh, supporting the fast and wide SCSI 2. We also have the usual complement of external ports. All right, high-end machine quite obviously. Now the point in the multiprocessing uh, that you can do in here is that you can do some things that are very processing intensive very fast obviously. Give us an example of a software application that really takes advantage of your multiprocessor capability. Well, on our screen here, we have an example of, of Photoshop, one of the best-known Macintosh applications. Uh, Adobe has gone out and actually rewritten the core engine of Photoshop to enable multiprocessing. So let me give an example of a very common filter that uh, a lot of the Photoshop users uh, use in a single processor mode. So by selecting the Gaussian blur, we are going out and accessing only one of the processors. This progress bar shows how quickly the process is progressing. So you're running that filter using one of your CPUs right now, CPUs right now, and it's going to normally take what, maybe 10, 12 seconds That's to do correct. something like this. Okay, so now and we, we go. see if it's been done. Okay, so we go up and look at this plug-in that Adobe wrote for us. Again, so by clicking this box, we are enabling multiprocessor. Mm -hmm. So let me undo what we did in that last, last Gaussian blur. And now we'll do the same process using all four processors. Now it should be noted that we're running this with four 132 megahertz processors. So even in the slow mode that we just saw, it was as fast as the fastest machine, and obviously that was much quicker. So mm -hmm. this machine is running three and a half times more or less in that case, faster than Apple's fastest 9500. All right, so the point in your machine here, this is obviously high end. This, what you've really done is created a workstation for doing high-end processing like this using the Mac OS. That's correct, and we have the ease of use of the Macintosh with the power of a SGI. I mean, this machine is very yeah. exciting for the people, obviously, that are interested in doing the kind of special effects that we've seen. The, uh, the Terminator, the mm -hmm. Forrest Gump, this machine finally makes that kind of capability affordable for the smaller and, it, and in terms of the multiprocessor design, I mean, that's your company did this work, right? That's correct. Apple contracted with Daystar. They have purchased the rights to this, but we still retain the development and the evangelism, and we'll be continuing to work with Apple in the future. A real powerful Mac. Thanks for showing it to us, Thanks Jack. for having us. Okay, two important things happened for Apple over the past few years, the success of the PowerBook and then the success of the Power Mac. Now Apple has brought them together in the first new Power PC PowerBook. We found them being used at Oracle, the database company, down the road here in Redwood City, California. The database products designed inside these gleaming towers are more often associated with mainframe servers in large corporations than with small companies and notebook computers. 
but the Oracle Corporation has decided to port its information management software to the portable computer, starting with the PowerPC-based Macintosh. Two typical uses of this product are actual standalone developers that are writing database applications. With Personal Oracle 7, they'll be able to uh, be not connected to the network and do all their development work and have complete control of their database and develop applications. The other main use of it is for having information right on the desktop as opposed to out on the network. So you can put a tremendous amount of information on that one machine and uh, be able to access it right there. Personal Oracle 7 is designed to run on the new Macintosh portables and desktop systems as a native Power Macintosh application. The workgroup software takes advantage of AppleScript and features cross-platform portability. According to Oracle, individual users in small companies can for the first time have the power and functionality of a scalable client-server system. But we're talking about a database that is truly an Oracle relational database that people have traditionally only seen on mainframes and Unix, Unix boxes. These things are now on the desktop platforms such as Windows 95 and uh, shortly on the Power Macintosh. Um, and they will have the full capabilities of a relational database as well as having the, the speed of, of the Oracle engine. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. It's a whole new world for Apple these days. Mac clones, a new OS on the horizon, fierce competition from Windows 95. Some pundits are wondering whether Apple can survive. Well, here to talk with us about the future of the Macintosh is the president of Creative Strategies, Tim Baharin. Welcome, Hi, Tim. how are you? Just on this show, we've seen uh, Apple out there licensing now, so we have Mac clones, not only Mac clones, but guys who are doing, in a way, more than the Mac does itself. Uh, working on the new OS. Let's talk about the clones first. What, what do you think about this idea of, of licensing the Mac finally after these many years to other people so I can go out and buy a Power 100, which looks to be a pretty good machine, probably less than I can buy a comparable Mac? Right. It's good that they're finally doing it. It would have been better if they'd done this five years ago. I mean, they really gave uh, Microsoft and the Windows a huge opportunity. However, you know, it's never too late, and, as they say, and I think what's going to happen is that there will be many other machines out there that are not Apple logoed, but instead these clones, it'll undercut Apple's pricing a little bit, and then there'll be a group of people who are, wi are willing to go, go for those clones based on those kind of prices. So I think from Apple's standpoint, they look at it as another way to expand their presence, and they really will still have big uh, numbers sold, but this expands it through the clones, and I think it's still important for them. So it's good for Apple, not bad that these other guys are going to be selling Mac lookalikes? No, they wouldn't have done the licensing if they didn't believe it was going to be good They'll for them. They'll make enough money on each of the clones. Right. What, what about Copeland? Is that an important new significant thing? Is it just another upgrade to 7.5? No, actually Copeland is a really significant product. For all of the people who actually own Macs, they're going to love Copeland. The multitasking, all of the new features are going to be really important to them. The fact that it's this late, though, I think is going to be somewhat of a problem. And I think that had they been able to get this out six, seven months ago, uh, they could have actually kept some of the people from jumping on the Windows 95 bandwagon. Coming out now, middle of 96, is going to be a more difficult situation for new users coming in because they've been dealing with this ma the, the PC hype for so long. What about the long-term future? Not even long-term, but short-term future for Apple on the Macintosh. They've got, what, 8-10% of the world market right now. Are they going to get hurt by the Windows 95 stuff? Uh, can they survive all this? Well, yeah, they'll be hurt by Windows 95 in the sense that they'll never have the opportunity to get the kind of numbers that Scully wanted. I remember Scully saying, that I'd like to have 20% market share. Yeah. At 8 to 9%, that's not great, but they still have a loyal following. They could still sell to that group. There's two areas, though, where we think Apple can still make some serious inroads. The home office and small business as, a, as one particular group, and then the actual consumer. Uh, there's a lot of people out there in the business who want solutions. They don't really care about Windows or mm -hmm. Mac. They want a good solution, easy to use, good price. If Apple can harness that message and do it right, they could really do some good there. And then again, the Mac is really still the easiest computer to use. And from a consumer standpoint, if they can zero in on that, that's another target. However, I don't think that'll gain them more than two or three more points overall mm -hmm. in the next couple of years. Tim, thanks a lot. Okay, if you would like to do some net surfing to find out more about the new Mac OS and the Mac clones, there are several sites you can check out. Our net master, Giles Bateman, has the details. Thanks, Stuart. Although you wouldn't know it from Apple's marketing, they are actually are working on a lot of cool new technology for the Macintosh. 
find out about it, you got to go to them. So here we are at Apple's support and information website. And uh, as you can see, you can find out information. You can get technical support, product descriptions uh, over here. There's a tech info library, a little cyber dog hint of things to come. But I think one of the coolest things about this site is simply the software updates that you can get. You can uh, download updates to different aspects of your system software. Now, of perhaps more interest to Mac users is the emerging clone market. So here I'm going to go to Power Computing's website, and I'm at actually in their configurator, which is my favorite part. You come in and you set up, you, you use these pop-up menus to describe the exact system you want, and then down at the bottom, you click Check Pricing, and you can actually submit that to Power Computing. They'll tell you what that system would cost. Now, let me get, hop out of Netscape here for just a second. For those of you who want a taste of things to come with Copeland, I downloaded a little extension called Aaron. Get it? Aaron Copeland. Anyway, here's the extension. I found it on eWorld. You can find it anywhere. You can find Mac Shareware. But it changes your interface to make it look like the new System 8 Copeland operating system. Now it's time for our weekly summary of what's new in the field of personal computing. Let's go to Studio E for this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, it is being widely reported that Microsoft and NBC are negotiating on a deal to provide a 24-hour news channel linked to an interactive online video service. And for the first time, Microsoft is lending its name to a PC. Packard Bell announced the Microsoft Station, a 133 megahertz Pentium system. More than 30 Microsoft titles are pre-installed on this mini tower. If you're still looking for gifts for the holidays, consider one of these new software products. There's a quarterly CD-ROM magazine called CD Gem with information on Jewish culture and heritage. Yearly subscriptions cost $100. If you're looking for a game with meaning, take a look at Endorphin. You maneuver a 3D six-colored cube around squares called Life Forces. There are inaudible positive affirmations as well as text messages to help the player relieve stress and feel good. This is not a, an, an not an attempt to manipulate, it's, it's an attempt to bring value and worthiness to, to an entertainment experience. For the project-minded child on your list, Philips introduced a series called Cybercraft. The first is fun with electronics with 25 electronic projects to create. Racing fans might enjoy Sony's Wipeout, steer around mines, missiles and rockets launched by your opponents. Well, if racing's too fast for you, there's PBA Bowling from Bethesda Software. Just like going to the bowling alley, only you don't have to change your shoes. Well, why not get a cat for your mouse? A company called Feline introduced mouse pads featuring cat takeoffs on the likes of William Shakespeare and David Letterman. There's a new CD for the Rolling Stones fan on your shopping list. Stripped features stone favorites played acoustically as well as video clips from the recording session. But I was on my own She told me later she was a machine operator She said I, the way I held the mic If you prefer to give jewelry to that someone special, Dallas Semiconductor has this digital decoder ring. No cereal boxes involved. This ring has an embedded memory chip and can store up to 64 kilobits. Can't get out to shop? Well, online services like the Virtual Vineyard let you avoid the crowds and send those last-minute gift baskets out for you. Once your shopping is done and you're planning your New Year's Eve, we've got one idea for you. Apple Computer is hosting a combination concert and technology fair in San Francisco. If you can't go in person, don't worry. You can access the party through an Apple Computer website. Well, that's it for this week's Random Access. Back to you, Stuart. Before we leave you, my pick of the week for a neat new computer product. If you got hooked on Myst, you might want to check out a relatively new game called Gadget. This is a Myst-type game only with people. It was created in Japan, and it features spooky music, great artwork, weird people, and these kinds of ominous black and white video clips. Like Myst, part of the game is to figure out what the game is about. You travel around gathering clues and collecting gadgets to be used in unraveling the secrets of the story. I haven't finished the game yet, but it is captivating in the same way that Myst draws you in. The game is called Gadget. It's distributed by Synergy. It costs about 60 bucks, and it runs on a Mac or a Windows PC. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back again next week with more neat stuff from the world of personal computer technology. I'm Stuart Chaffee. We'll see you here next time.
Computer Chronicles is made possible.